So if you clicked on this video here, you're probably familiar, at least somewhat, with the HHN icons. You know, the Jacks, the Chances, the Eddies, the Directors, you know, all of those characters. But not every idea is a Jack or a Chance. Not every idea is super popular. Some of these icons throughout the years have been dismissed by audiences, disregarded for being at the event at a wrong time, or just never really getting their foot off the ground to begin with. Therefore, these are the characters Characters that kind of interest me, that have a more tragic story in their incorporation into Halloween Horror Nights, and I wanted to share some of my favorite of those stories with you today. I wanted to take a deep dive on the misfits of misfits, the icons that are forgotten and overlooked at Halloween Horror Nights. Now, while the first character may be familiar to some of you hardcore fans, she has an interesting enough story that I really want to dive into when it comes to an icon that not only was rejected once, but twice. I'm of course talking about Cindy Kane. So in 2000, HHN launched Jack, the first original icon for the event, and Jack was so successful that they wanted to try it again in 2001, incorporating his brother into the event, which didn't really work because of the recent 9-11 attacks that they really wanted to tone down the event, so they just brought Jack back again for another year. But in 2002, they really wanted to shake things up, moving the event to Islands of Adventure and creating a new icon, Cindy Kane. Cindy Kane would be a demented little girl who would puppeteer each of the scare zones and houses and the monsters within them as all of them were tailored to her imagination. However, in a similar situation to Eddie's the year prior, Cindy was shelved due to an unfortunately high number of child kidnappings in the area during 2002. Therefore, she was scrapped as the icon for 2002, replaced by her father, Albert Kane, aka the caretaker. So we lost one icon, but gained another one. It's sort of a bittersweet story. From there, she fell into relative obscurity until proposed again to be the icon for Halloween Horror Nights, this time for their 20th anniversary event in 2010. But again, she would be rejected in favor of Fear, an icon who'd really elevate the storyline amongst all the other icons of the event. However, she wasn't completely thrown out of the event as she did get her own house originally meant to be her icon house titled The Orphanage Ashes to Ashes. This house would be featured in Cary, Ohio, the location originally tied to the Canes in 2002 that eventually became super popular in its own right, but regardless, this house would be focused on her orphanage, which she was burning down, which was interesting considering her real-world history as sort of a rejected icon. Not really being featured at the event beyond the appearance in a scare zone, the icon house for HHN 25, Jack presents 25 years of monsters and mayhem, and the Welcome to Scary House centered around Cary, Ohio at HHN 30. While Cindy hasn't had an icon year of her own, she's probably the most popular one on this list just because the hardcore fans definitely remember all the times they tried to integrate Cindy into the event, but her case is truly an example of right idea, wrong time, and hopefully she gets a full year sooner rather than later. Now this next character moves us forward to 2008. Fresh off the heels of a string of successful icon years throughout the 2000s, the event was growing and growing when it came to its original storytelling capabilities, which ultimately led us to Halloween Horror Nights Reflections of Fear. Now Reflections of Fear would be similar to other event years like Tales of Terror and Islands of Fear where the icon would control all of the stories found within the houses in one way or another, with everything tying into the that year's icon, Bloody Mary. Now, Bloody Mary has quite a bit of backstory here, but I'm gonna try to explain it in the most condensed fashion possible, so here we go. The story goes that in 1908, Mary Worthington, a school teacher in Cary, Ohio, goes missing. Cut to about 50 years later, her granddaughter, Dr. Mary Ghana, inherits some of Worthington's possessions that start to take over her consciousness. Not too long after that, she is denied funding for her experimental fear therapy program and decides to take matters into her own hands, creating her own program. However, the disappearance of one Charlie McPherson causes her program to be investigated by Boris Schuster, a character for a whole nother episode. And when Schuster arrives on the scene, Agana is gone. It seems like she's been murdered, but there was no body. She would then return in 2008, sort of creating a portal between this dimension and a sort of mirror dimension, and this mirror dimension would host the event that year, containing five different realms. Fears, tales, urban legends, 
nightmares, and myths. Like I said, it's really, really complicated, but this backstory really shows the interconnected relationship in that year's event. So in a year that has so much lore, so much backstory, so much theming, why haven't we seen her since then? Well, this situation is a bit more complicated as Bloody Mary's icon legitimacy is really up for debate and has been since 2008. Many, including myself, consider her as an icon because she's so important to the event that year, she was all over event merchandise, marketing, everything, and so important to the story of the event. However, Bloody Mary is a third party character in design and really the only things created by Universal were that backstory and were just sort of her personality and the interpretation of Bloody Mary here. But because of that, Universal can't really freely use her as much as they can with the other icons, hence why you haven't seen her since 2008. However, she has been lurking around without being officially seen, with many, many references and Easter eggs being thrown into other houses. I don't think we're gonna see Bloody Mary again unless they can figure out the copyright situation. So this is just another case of, of some external factor making her overlooked when it comes to some of the other icons. Although she isn't forgotten, the fans do love Bloody Mary. And before we move forward, if you like this video so far, let me know by leaving a like on this video and subscribing to the channel. Thank you all so much for your support on these videos and uh, let's keep moving. Now, while Cindy Kane and Mary Ghana are relatively well known with the fans, as I've said before, the next few don't really get as much love from the fandom. And to start, we must travel forward to 2014 and HHN 24. And right here, we're in the middle of what's known as the IP years, with The Walking Dead and Halloween being major players of the event, but within one of these scare zones, a new character would sort of act as an original icon for that year. At HHN 24, Central Park would host the Bayou of Blood Scare Zone, which was themed to voodoos and the bayous of Louisiana. And the star of the show here would be the Voodoo Queen. She would host public sacrificial rituals into the scare zone, you know, nothing too weird for HHN icons. And other than the sacrifices, she would just kind of roam through the scare zone, and that was sort of the extent of the Voodoo Queen at that year. But she would reappear the following year, in 2015, the 25th anniversary of Halloween Horror Nights, in the Icon Scare Zone, alongside other prominent characters like Eddie, the director, and the storyteller. And notably, the Voodoo Queen and the Bayou of Blood will be adapted into a house at HHN 27, titled Dead Waters. This house would prominently feature the Voodoo Queen and take you throughout the bayou and even into her sacrifice lair. While she played a relatively minor role at HHN that year, her appearance was marked with controversy. Her sacrifice was quickly pulled from the event for a variety of reasons, mostly having to do with the cultural context of the scene, hence why her role was toned down for Dead Waters. And that could be the primary reason why she really wasn't referenced too much after that. Or maybe it was just that the guests weren't too interested in her character enough for Universal to really dive into her backstory. Regardless, I really hope Universal could acknowledge her, maybe with some more backstory and a reworked character when the icons return again. Now, as I mentioned, Halloween Horror Nights 25 was a celebration of the icons, and even out of that event, we got Chance in 2016 as the next HHN icon. But 2017 also had a character that not a lot of people know about, and his name was Bone. Now, Bone is a pretty simple character. He's a big guy who looks like the Grim Reaper, complete with a large scythe. So what? He's big and scary. What makes him a true icon? Well, when I tell you this guy was literally everywhere when it came to this event. Event marketing, merchandise, media events, being in the tribute store, and he was also the main character of that year's Hollywood Scare Zone, Festival of the Deadliest. And while he would just kind of roam around the Scare Zone, the Scare Zone did expand on his backstory just a little bit though. As one of the skull collectors, he would parade the streets with his brides as blood and bone would seek out souls. Pretty simple stuff. Now while all the characters I mentioned before have some interesting position within the lore or a house that sort of expands their story, this is it for Bone. And because of this, plus the lukewarm reception of his character at this event, he was just kind of forgotten. And honestly, I get it. Now he has appeared since then, most notably in the 30 years 30 fears scare zone at HHN 30. So maybe at some point Universal can expand on his story, maybe giving more details towards who he is, where he comes from, what the skull collectors are all about. But until then, it looks like Bone is just gonna be amongst the forgotten few when it comes to the icons. Now I think I saved the most interesting forgotten icon story for last because this icon didn't have a house, didn't have a scare zone, didn't really ever even appear at the event. 
This is the story of an icon that would never be. This is the story of Nathaniel Crow. While 2008 would later be taken over by Bloody Mary and her reflections of fear, this year was meant to host Nathaniel Crow. And all we really know about him is his backstory. Nathaniel begins his story as an unsuccessful pumpkin salesman, plagued by rotting pumpkins as he's approached by Jack Schmidt, aka Jack the Clown. Telling Crow that the land is cursed, Jack is able to purchase it and bring over his Carnival of Carnage to that area. Crow is drawn to the carnival, but questions his ability to survive every visit when every other visitor perishes. Once the carnival leaves, he finds a mysterious poster for the carnival, and his blood forms words into the poster, creating a cryptic rhyme. Forgotten are the ways of old, tradition's blood black and cold. Up through dirt roots grow and burst, evils return, you'll see what came first. When ravens and crows made the night black, pumpkins were carved to keep the evil back. When the howl of the wind sent shivers down spines, graves of our dead covered in vines. When the black cats crossed paths and the wolves howl, true witches did more than laugh and scowl. Your time has come, Nathaniel Crow. Outside the box, you'll think you'll grow. Terror's traditions in ways you will demand. Halloween's true self is at hand. Now, upon reading this rhyme, he finds himself in a field of freakish pumpkins and dead trees, and atop the trees are crows ready to peck his body apart, ripping out his flesh and replacing it with chunks of pumpkin. Crow would then become the embodiment of Halloween Reborn. As cool as this sounds, Crow would sadly never make it to the event as a living, breathing icon. However, a static figure of Nathaniel Crow being attacked by crows could be found in Wicked Growth, Realm of the Pumpkin at HHN 30, which is really interesting in how that house ties into traditional Halloween and connects with the story of the Pumpkin Lord. So maybe there's a connection between the two that hasn't been explored yet. Crow is probably my favorite icon from this list, not just because of his really incredible backstory, but because of the fact that he is just a concept, an idea waiting to be explored that could really make for a menacing and fantastic icon if they choose to revisit him. But there you have it folks, the forgotten and overlooked icons of Halloween Horror Nights. Let me know who's your favorite from this list and who I might have left out on this list for me to possibly do a part two to this video. But again, I hope you enjoyed watching this video, and I, of course, will catch you in the next one.